Gracious Lord, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. We pray now that, Father, as we delve deeper into it, that you would inspire us through your Holy Spirit to see your word perhaps in a, a new way, a new revelation for us, that we may draw closer in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'd like to begin with a confession, and that is that all of us have kind of fears and phobias, and I have to say that cemeteries have never been one of my most favorite places to (laughs) hang out. But I remember frequenting one when I was a kid. Some of you might be familiar with the game called Ghost in the Graveyard. You remember playing that? I see a few hands. Yep, going up. Well, if I remember correctly, one person plays the ghost, and then the other kids would go out and try not to be caught. You know, it basically is kind of a scarier version of hide-and-seek when you get right down to it. Well, when I was in grade school, I used to like actually playing that game. And what made it even more exciting is that we lived very near an old church that had a creepy graveyard. So when it would get dark, sometimes late at night, sometimes not known to my parents, I would sneak out with friends and we'd go to the cemetery to play this hiding behind the tombstones game, um, which was just really kind of freaky after a while. (laughs) Now, scary as it was for me to go running around in a graveyard after dark, I can only imagine what a scary sight it must have been for the prophet Ezekiel in today's Old Testament lesson. I mean, think about it. What if God told you to go to a cemetery and speak to the graves there and call the decayed bones to life? I don't know about you, but for me, I think first I'd probably laugh sarcastically, then cry and cry again, and then then beg the Lord to change the assignment. I mean, seriously, who wants to see a zombie apocalypse and act totally cool with it. (laughs) No, thank you, Father. (laughs) Send me to the lion's den. I'd rather do that instead. You can give Daniel this assignment. But of course, that's not what happened. We see Ezekiel writes, he says, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. See, apparently God picked Ezekiel up and and transported him to the middle of this valley, which was not just full of gravestones, but of exposed and dry bones. What an eerie feeling (coughs) that must have been. And so as he recalls his vision this morning, we are also urged to go to the graveyard when things in our life maybe seem hopeless or impossible. Now, graveyards, of course, are some very sad places to visit, especially if we happen to have loved ones who are buried there. When I walk through them today, I, my imagination is always kind of racing. Maybe you do this too sometimes, you know, wondering what were these people's lives like who are buried here around me. The especially sad ones, of course, are the gravestones of young children. I had an assignment when I was uh, in college. I was studying landscape architecture, and I had the assignment to give a presentation on the art and architecture of the American cemetery. And it sent me off on travels kind of up and down the East Coast, all these old historic cemeteries to kind of look at and, and record how we have basically honored and revered are dead. And it was, it was fascinating. It was, it was creepy. Um, <laughs> but just reading some of the epitaphs that were written towards our dead um, just made me really, as again, say, think about what were these lives like of these people who are now gone. You know, sometimes doing funerals can also be sad and depressing, can't they? Because I think nowhere is the message of God's condemnation of sin more clearer than when we're sitting facing the death of someone we cared about. We're reminded of the passage we heard from Romans today, that the wages of sin 
our death. Our death. You know, the graveyard is actually full of people who were designed originally to live forever, but whose lives were cut short, separated from their souls, all due to the fall of humankind after creation. And when you look at a gravestone, especially of someone who's close to you, you realize that, that you will never see your loved one on this side of heaven. And there's a loneliness, a sadness. What a sad view this must have also been for Ezekiel. He says, he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. You see, these were not just bodies that had recently passed away and could be revived with CPR. These were completely dead, rotted bodies without an ounce of life in them. And what was even worse, God says to Ezekiel, son of man, these are the bones of the whole house of Israel. And so from this, we can tell that God was giving Ezekiel a sobering vision of the spiritual lives of Israel. Now here, maybe a little background might be helpful to put this passage in context. In the year 586 BC, Jerusalem was totally ruined by King Nebuchadnezzar and his great Babylonian army. Solomon's temple, which of course had been the, the pride and glory of the people of Israel for almost 400 years, was now reduced to ashes and rubble. All the inhabitants of Jerusalem had now been taken either to Chaldea or to Babylon in captivity, including Mataniah, who was the last king of Judah. It says that he was taken blinded and in chains off to Babylon. And although they had been warned repeatedly by God through his prophets, including Ezekiel, they continually, continually were turning a deaf ear to God's call. So now, basically, they were spiritually dead. They were saying, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. They'd come to complete despair in their Babylonian captivity. They thought that God was never going to take them back at this point. And so since they had lost all hope, basically, they completely lost their faith in God. And you know, when you think about it, this is also the way that God describes every unbeliever, isn't it? It says in Ephesians 1, as for, excuse me, Ephesians 2, verse 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. And in Romans 8, it says, the mind of the sinful man is hostile to God. You see, life would seem a lot easier if people were at least amicable to the Lord, if we at least had some glimmer of hope. But we see when the Apostle Paul describes the world as dead in their sins, it doesn't leave a whole lot of room for hope. And Jesus only predicted that the situation was going to get worse, if it possibly could. In Matthew 24, it states, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most people will grow cold. False Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles, which will deceive even the elect. So when God, you see, presented Ezekiel with this desolate graveyard and asks him, son of man, can these bones live? What did Ezekiel say? He said, well, O oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. I mean, basically what he was saying, I don't know. He knew that God was almighty, but how could these parched bones live again? I thought about that, and I thought, you know, many times we kind of react the same way when we're in hopeless or, or desolate situations in our lives. When you stand in the middle of a, of a graveyard in your life, don't you often have the same question? Lord, I don't know. How, how is this going to change? How is life going to come back in this situation? Now, I'm not necessarily referring here to a literal graveyard because I think there are many graveyards in which we can find ourselves in, in life. As for example, are you living in a graveyard of finances? Does there seem to be no way out of a situation of debt and you're ho feeling hopeless and in despair? Are you living in a graveyard maybe of, of dead love? 
love in a relationship, maybe even love in a marriage? Does it seem hopeless? You know, when I see how paganistic America has become, where it is accepted, you know, this kind of pluralistic religion which says, well, we all go to the same place regardless of what you believe. I wonder, can these bones live? When I turn on the TV and I see children as young as 12 years old in, in sexual relationships, or, or kids in college who are, are boasting about drugs and, and the sex that they're having, I wonder to myself, can these dry and dead bones really live? You know, it doesn't seem like anyone wants to hear what God has to say anymore. And when I think about the kind of pressures that my college-age daughter has to face with safe sex and the, the disintegration of morals being preached everywhere she goes, I, I wonder to myself, can these living spiritual bodies continue to live? Or will their faith go dry? Sometimes it certainly does seem kind of hopeless out there, doesn't it? And like Ezekiel, we also are saying, Lord, <laughs> you alone know. You alone know. But we know that God's word from this passage brings life. And also from our gospel lesson, most of you remember the story of Lazarus that was recounted in John 11. A man named Lazarus was sick. He was from the village of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And this Mary, whose brother is Lazarus and now sick, was the same Mary who poured perfume on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, telling him, saying, The Lord, the one you love, is sick. And when Jesus heard this, he says, Well, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. See, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And yet, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, you heard it said that he stayed there for two more days. It's interesting. Jesus actually purposely stayed away from Bethany for two days to give Lazarus' body time to start decaying. He wanted to make the situation totally hopeless, totally impossible, so that God's glory could truly be revealed. Why? Because I think God likes these kind of situations. And so he showed also Ezekiel, this valley of dead and dry bones. It was seemingly hopeless also, but not with the Lord of hosts. You see, Ezekiel knew that God would bring life to these bones, but Somehow he seemed hesitant to say, yes, I know you're going to do this, Lord. And so it's interesting to see how God renewed Ezekiel's faith in his time of doubt. Ezekiel writes here, he says, Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will <clears throat> put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel says, I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound as flesh appeared on them and skin covered them. Bone to bone came together but there was no breath in them. You know, the description reminds me of the old song, and I heard a, a few people singing it in the back of the room today that knew this lesson was coming, you know. The toe bone's connected to the foot bone, the foot bone's connected to the ankle bone, all, the, all that, yeah, yeah. Sounds like that, doesn't it? But God wasn't done with Ezekiel yet, was he? In verse 9 there it says, Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So Ezekiel says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. What an awesome feeling that must have been for Ezekiel. Here he had been 
preaching to the Israelites for years and years, and again and again, they just weren't getting it. He must have thought to himself, what am I doing here? But when God gave him this experience, allowing Ezekiel to speak his words through his voice, what a rush that must have been. Ezekiel would have then realized that there's hope for the people of Israel. All I have to do is preach the word, stay in the word that God has given us. This is the way that I think that God continually works throughout history when you think about it. Like when Lazarus's body lay dead in the grave for four days, it was beginning to decom decompose, wasn't it? It couldn't hear, it couldn't move, it was dead. But what did Jesus do? Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. You see, Lazarus's, Lazarus's resurrection had nothing to do with anything that Lazarus himself had done. He was dead. It all had to do with the powerful word. Jesus was able to put life into Lazarus's decaying bones and breath back into his lungs. Just as in creation, God had created life where there was no life. So when, when Ezekiel conveyed this vision to the Israelites who were living under captivity, it gave them hope, hope that God promised them that I will put my spirit in you and you will live and you will go and settle in your own land, the promised land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I have done it, declares the Lord. See, it shows them that God hadn't given up on them. He was going to take them back to that promised land. And it just so happened that God did what he said. He led them to the promised land. A remnant was, was brought back to the promised land under the guidance of people like Ezra and Nehemiah. And through that remnant, the savior of the entire world was eventually born. The Israelites were resurrected once again to spiritual life. So what does this have to say to us? Well, if you've been living in the middle of a graveyard, there's good news here for you. There's hope. You see, if God could bring a graveyard of dead bones to life, then he could breathe life into any situation, no matter how hopeless you may think it is. There's hope here for a resurrection. If you've given up, for example, perhaps on a neighbor or a friend, thinking, ah, they're never going to come to faith. It's a lost cause. Think again. If you've written off, off, written off a family member, and many of us struggle with members of our family who have not stayed in the faith or, or come to faith. The news is don't give up. Why? Because it says the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. There's power in God's word. Now, believe me, I need this sermon as much as maybe some of you do this morning. As I think several of you know, I serve as a chaplain in a continuing care retirement community where the average age of the residents there is 90 years old. Usually I conduct five services a week, sometimes even more. Obviously there's many memorial services that take place. But let me tell you, this age group can be a tough crowd. <laughs> sometimes I'm just happy if everybody stays awake for the whole service. <laughs> and even if the ones fall asleep, if they don't snore, I'm happy. <laughs> Needless to say, I find it's, you know, it's not a ministry where you receive a lot of continual encouragement and support. I find myself continually thinking, what else can I do? What, what maybe I'm doing wrong? I'm, I'm preaching the word. We're singing the, the praises to, to the Lord. What more can I do? And sometimes it's easy in those kind of situations to, to think, oh, well, the word just isn't working. It's easy to think, maybe I should just try something else. 
But then I'm continually reminded that my calling is to faithfully preach the word in season and out and to leave the results to God, to trust him to move as he did in the situation of the dry bones and with the resurrection of Lazarus. You see, in my experience as a priest, I've seen you know, many congregations drawing corpses into their churches with the lure of, of great programs, you know, a great youth group, a good daycare program, a fantastic nursery, a beautiful building. They do an excellent job of, of bringing folks in, but the sad thing is that once they bring them in, they're afraid of somehow offending these people with God's law or with specific doctrine. They've watered down the word so that the, the Ten Commandments are really just kind of talked about as ten suggestions. You know, the threat of eternal and final judgment is taboo. We don't mention that. The promise of forgiveness through baptism is never laid out. And so if these new prospects only hear funny stories during the sermon, what good does it do then? It's kind of like taking a dead corpse and trying to put nice clothing on it. Well, it still stinks on the inside if that's all you do, doesn't it? Yeah. You see, the encouragement for Ezekiel is the same for us, and that is just stick to the word. Stick to the word because it works. It convicts and condemns with the law and then renews and bring life with the promise of forgiveness and eternal life through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what brings life from death. That's what builds our faith. That's it. We need to remember this in our interactions with our, our friends, our neighbors, our family. All you can do is tell them what God's word says and how it's impacted your life. Because the only thing that will give life from death is the word of Christ. Now, if they don't like it, if they reject it, well, all you can do is let them stay dead at the moment. Don't waste your efforts on dressing up a dead corpse. But still, we need to pray for them continually because you never know what seed has been planted. So let me conclude by maybe asking you a question. If you had to choose between going to a wedding or a funeral, which one would you choose? You might be surprised that it says in Ecclesiastes 7 that it's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of every man. Death is the destiny of every man. You see, we the living should take this to heart. It may not be very pretty going to a funeral or a graveyard, but it opens your eyes to the wages of sin. Personally, I enjoy preaching at funerals much more than weddings, and fortunately I get a lot more opportunity in my <laughs> current ministry to do that. And I say that because when people are faced with death, they want to know about hope. They want to know where is the hope. So Ezekiel says to us today, go to the graveyard, see the dead and dry bones, look at the filth, and then listen to the word, speak the word, and watch the dead come back to life. What a miraculous sight it is. What a powerful weapon we have in the word of God, a weapon that brings life in the midst of death. You know, after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, he declares, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. So thanks be to God who has breathed new life into each one of us through the gift of his son, the resurrection and the life. Jesus asked Martha, do you believe this, that I'm the resurrection and the life? It's a question I want to leave you with today. Do we believe this? We need to, because it's truly the way to life everlasting. Amen.